Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book One, Chapter One. We have had occasion before now to reflect how often democracies have been overthrown by the desire of some other type of government, how often monarchies and oligarchies have been swept away by movements of the people, how often would-be despots have fallen in their turn, some at the outset by one stroke, while those who have maintained their rule over so brief a season are looked upon with wonder as marvels of sagacity and success. The same lesson, we have had little doubt, was to be learnt from the family. The household might be great or small. Even the master of a few could hardly count on the obedience of his little flock. And so, one idea leading to another, we came to shape our reflections thus. Drovers may certainly be called the rulers of their cattle, and horse-breeders the rulers of their studs. All herdsmen, in short, may reasonably be considered the governors of the animals they guard. If, then, we were to believe the evidence of our senses, was it not obvious that flocks and herds were more ready to obey their keepers than men, their rulers? Watch the cattle wending their way wherever their herdsmen guide them. See them grazing in the pastures where they are sent and abstaining from forbidden grounds, the fruit of their own bodies they yield to their master to use as he thinks best. Nor have we ever seen one flock among them all combining against their guardian, either to disobey him or to refuse him the absolute control of their produce. On the contrary, they are more apt to show hostility against other animals than against the owner who derives advantage from them. But with man the rule is converse. Men unite against none so readily as against those whom they see attempting to rule over them. As long, therefore, as we follow these reflections, we could not but conclude that man is by nature fitted to govern all creatures, except his fellow man. But when we came to realize the character of Cyrus the Persian, we were led to a change of mind. Here is a man, we said, who won for himself obedience from thousands of his fellows, from cities and tribes innumerable. We must ask ourselves whether the government of men is, after all, an impossible or even a difficult task, provided one set about it in the right way. Cyrus, we knew, found the readiest obedience in his subjects, though some of them dwelt at a distance which it would take days and months to traverse and among them were men who had never set eyes on him, and for the matter of that could never hope to do so, and yet they were willing to obey him. Cyrus did indeed eclipse all other monarchs before or since, and I include not only those who have inherited their power, but those who have won empire by their own exertions. How far he surpassed them all, may be felt if we remember that no Scythian, although the Scythians are reckoned by their myriads, have ever succeeded in dominating a foreign nation. Indeed, the Scythian would be well content could he but keep his government unbroken over his own tribe and people. The same is true of the Thracians and the Illyrians, and indeed of all other nations within our ken. In Europe, at any rate, the condition is even now one of independence, and of such separation as would seem to be permanent. Now this was the state in which Cyrus found the tribes and peoples of Asia, when, at the head of a small Persian force, he started on his career. The Medes and the Hyrcanians accepted his leadership willingly, but it was through conquest that he won Syria, Assyria, Arabia, Cappadocia, and two Phrygias. Lydia, Caria, Phoenicia, and Babylonia. Then he established his rule over the Bactrians, Indians, and Sicilians, over the Sakians, Pamphlagonians, and Magadinians, over a host of other tribes, the very names of which defy the memory of the chronicler, 
and less of all he brought to the hellenes in asia beneath his sway and by a descent on the seaboard cyprus and egypt also it is obvious that among this congeries of nations few if any could have spoken the same language as himself or understood one another but none the less cyrus was able so to penetrate that vast extent of country by the sheer terror of his personality that the inhabitants were prostrate before him not one of them dared lift hand against him yet he was able at the same time to inspire them all with so deep a desire to please him and win his favor that all they asked was to be guided by his judgment and his alone thus he knit himself a complex of nationalities so vast that it would have taxed a man's endurance merely to traverse his empire in any one direction east or west or south or north from the palace which was its centre for ourselves considering his title to our admiration proved we set ourselves to inquire what his parentage might have been and his natural parts and how he was trained and brought up to attain so high a pitch of excellence in the government of men and all we could learn from others about him or felt we might infer for ourselves we will here endeavor to set forth end of section one of cyropedia the education of cyrus this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain recording by lynn thompson Cyropedia the education of Cyrus by Xenophon translated by H. D. Dakins Book one chapter two the father of Cyrus so runs a story was Cambyses a king of the Persians and one of the Perseidae Who looked to Perseus as the founder of their race? His mother it is agreed was Mandani the daughter of Astyages king of the Medes of cyrus himself even now in the songs and stories of the east the record lives that nature made him most fair to look upon and set in his heart the threefold love of man of knowledge and of honor he would endure all labors he would undergo all dangers for the sake of glory blessed by nature with such gifts of soul and body his memory lives to this day in the mindful heart of ages it is true that he was brought up according to the laws and customs of the persians and of these laws it must be noted that while they aim as laws elsewhere at the common weal their guiding principle is far other than that which most nations follow most states permit their citizens to bring up their own children at their own discretion and allow the grown men to regulate their own lives at their own will and then they lay down certain prohibitions for example not to pick and steal not to break into another man's house not to strike a man unjustly not to commit adultery not to disobey the magistrate and so forth and on the transgressor they impose a penalty but the persian laws try as it were to steal a march on time to make their citizens from the beginning incapable of setting their hearts on any wickedness or shameful conduct whatsoever and this is how they set about their object in their cities they have an open place or square dedicated to freedom free square they call it where stand the palace and other public buildings from this place all goods for sale are rigidly excluded and all hawkers and hucksters with their yells and cries and vulgarities they must go elsewhere so that their clamor may not mingle with and mar the grace and orderliness of the educated classes this square where the public buildings stand is divided into four squares which are assigned as follows one for the boys another for the youths a third for the grown men and the last for those who are past the age of military service the law requires all the citizens to present themselves at certain times and seasons in their appointed places the lads and the grown men must be there at daybreak the elders may as a rule choose their own time except on certain fixed days when they too are expected to present themselves like the rest moreover the young men are bound to sleep at night round the public buildings with their arms at their side 
only the married men among them are exempt and need not be on duty at night unless notice has been given though even in their case frequent absence is thought unseemly over each of these divisions are placed twelve governors twelve being the number of the persian tribes the governors of the boys are chosen from the elders and those are appointed who are thought best fitted to make the best of their lads the governors of the youths are selected from the grown men and on the same principle and for the grown men themselves and their own governors the choice falls on those who will it is hoped make them most prompt to carry out their appointed duties and fulfil the commands imposed by the supreme authority finally the elders themselves have precedence of their own chosen to see that they too perform their duty to the full we will now describe the services demanded from the different classes and thus it will appear how the persians endeavour to improve their citizens the boys go to school and give their time to learning justice and righteousness they will tell you they come for that purpose and the phrase is as natural with them as it is for us to speak of lads learning their letters the masters spend the chief part of the day in deciding cases for their pupils for in this boy world as in the grown-up world without occasions of indictment are never far to seek there will be charges we know of picking and stealing of violence of fraud of calumny and so forth the case is heard and the offender if shown to be guilty is punished nor does he escape who is found to have accused one of his fellows unfairly and there is one charge the judges do not hesitate to deal with a charge which is the source of much hatred among grown men but which they seldom press in the courts the charge of ingratitude the culprit convicted of refusing to repay a debt of kindness when it was fully in his power meets with severe chastisement they reason that the ungrateful man is the most likely to forget his duty to the gods to his parents to his fatherland and his friends shamelessness they hold treads close on the heels of ingratitude and thus ingratitude is the ringleader and chief instigator to every kind of baseness further the boys are instructed in temperance and self-restraint and they find the utmost help towards the attainment of this virtue in the self-respecting behaviour of their elders shown them day by day then they are taught to obey their rulers and here again nothing is of greater value than the studied obedience to authority manifested by their elders everywhere continence in meat and drink is another branch of instruction and they have no better aid in this than first the example of their elders who never withdraw to satisfy their carnal cravings until those in authority dismiss them and next the rule that the boys must take their food not with their mother but with their master and not till the governor gives the sign they bring from home the staple of their meal dry bread with nasturtium for a relish and to slake their thirst they bring a drinking cup to dip in the running stream in addition they are taught to shoot with the bow and to fling the javelin the lads follow their studies till the age of sixteen or seventeen and then they take their places as young men after that they spend their time as follows for ten years they are bound to sleep at night round the public buildings as we said before and this for two reasons to guard the community and to practice self-restraint because that season of life the persians conceive stands most in need of care during the day they present themselves before the governors for service to the state and whenever necessary they remain in a body round the public buildings moreover when the king goes out to hunt which he will do several times a month he takes half the company with him and each man must carry bow and arrows a sheathed dagger or sagaris slung beside the quiver a light shield and two javelins one to hunt and the other to use if need be at close quarters the reason of this public sanction for the chase is not far to seek the king leads just as he does in war hunting in person at the head of the field and making his men follow because it is felt that the exercise itself is the best possible training for the needs of war 
it accustoms a man to early rising it hardens him to endure heat and cold it teaches him to march and to run at the top of his speed he must perforce learn to let fly arrow and javelin the moment the quarry is across his path and above all the edge of his spirit must needs be sharpened by encountering any of the mightier beasts he must deal his stroke when the creature closes and stand on guard when it makes its rush indeed it would be hard to find a case in war that has not its parallel in the chase but to proceed the young men set out with provisions that are ampler naturally than the boys fare but otherwise the same during the chase itself they would not think of breaking their fast but if a halt is called to beat up the game or for any hunter's reason then they will make as it were a dinner of their breakfast and hunting again on the morrow till dinner time they will count the two days as one because they have only eaten one day's food this they do in order that if the like necessity should arise in war they may be found equal to it as relish to their bread these young men have whatever they may kill in the chase or failing that nasturtium like the boys and if one should ask how they can enjoy the meal with nasturtium for their only condiment and water for their only drink let him bethink himself how sweet barley bread and wheaten can taste to the hungry man and water to the thirsty as to the young men who are left at home they spend their time in shooting and hurling the javelin and practicing all they learnt as boys in one long trial of skill beside this public games are open to them and prizes are offered and the tribe which can claim the greatest number of lads distinguished for skill and courage and faithfulness is given the meed of praise from all the citizens who honor not only their present governor but the teacher who trained them when they were boys moreover these young men are also employed by the magistrates if garrison work needs to be done or if malefactors are to be tracked or robbers run down or indeed on any errand which calls for strength of limb and fleetness of foot such is the life of the youth but when the ten years are accomplished they are classed as grown men and from this time forth for five and twenty years they live as follows first they present themselves as in youth before the magistrates for service to the state wherever there is need for strength and sound sense combined if an expedition be on foot the men of this grade march out not armed with the bow or light shield any longer but equipped with what are called the close combat arms a breastplate up to the throat a buckler on the left arm just as the persian warrior appears in pictures and for the right hand a dagger or a sword lastly it is from this grade that all the magistrates are appointed except the teachers for the boys but when the five and twenty years are over and the men have reached the age of fifty years or more then they take the ranks as elders and the title is deserved these elders no longer go on military service beyond the frontier they stay at home and decide all cases public and private both even capital charges are left to their decision and it is they who choose all the magistrates if a youth or a grown man breaks the law he is brought into court by the governors of his tribe who act as suitors in the case aided by any other citizens who please the cause is heard before the elders and they pronounce judgment and the man who is condemned is disenfranchised for the rest of his days and now to complete the picture of the whole persian society i will go back a little with the help of what has been said before the account may now be brief the persians are said to number something like one hundred and twenty thousand men and of these no one is by law debarred from honor or office on the contrary every persian is entitled to send his children to the public schools of righteousness and justice as a fact all who can afford to bring up their children without working do send them there those who cannot must forego the privilege a lad who has passed through a public school has a right to go and take his place among the youths but those who have not gone through the first course may not join them in the same way the youths who have fulfilled the duties of their class are entitled eventually to rank with the men and to share in office and honor but they must first spend their full time among the youths if not they go no further 
finally those who as grown men have lived without reproach may take their station at last among the elders thus these elders form a college every member of which has passed through the full circle of noble learning and this is that persian polity and that persian training which in their belief can win them the flower of excellence and even to this day signs are left bearing witness to that ancient temperance of theirs and the ancient discipline that preserved it to this day it is still considered shameful for a persian to spit in public or wipe his nose or show signs of wind or be seen going apart for his natural needs and they could not keep this standard unless they were accustomed to a temperate diet and were trained to exercise and toil so that the humours of the body were drawn off in other ways hitherto we have spoken of the persians as a whole we will now go back to our starting point and recount the deeds of cyrus from his childhood End of section two. Fun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Ottens. Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book one, chapter three. Until he was twelve years old or more, Cyrus was brought up in the manner we have described, and showed himself to be above all his fellows in his aptitude for learning and in the noble and manly performance of every duty. But about this time, Astyages sent for his daughter and her son, desiring greatly to see him, because he had heard how noble and fair he was. So it fell out that Mandane came to Astyages, bringing her son Cyrus with her. And as soon as they met, the boy, when he heard that Astyages was his mother's father, fell on his neck and kissed him without more ado, like the loving lad nature had made him, as though he had been brought up at his grandfather's side from the first, and the two of them had been playmates of old. Then he looked and saw that the king's eyes were stenciled, and his cheeks painted, and that he wore false curls after the fashion of the Medes in those days. For these adornments and the purple robes, the tunics, the necklaces, and the bracelets, they are all Median first and last, not Persian. The Persian, as you find him at home even nowadays, still keeps to his plainer dress and his plainer style of living. The boy, seeing his grandfather's splendor, kept his eyes fixed on him and cried, O oh, mother, how beautiful my grandfather is! Then his mother asked him which he thought the handsomer, his father or his grandfather, and he answered at once, My father is the handsomest of all the Persians, but my grandfather much the handsomest of all the Medes I ever set eyes on, at home or abroad. At that Astyages drew the child to his heart, and gave him a beautiful robe, and bracelets and necklaces in sign of honor, and when he rode out the boy must ride beside him, on a horse with a golden bridle, just like King Astyages himself. And Cyrus, who had a soul as sensitive to beauty as to honor, was pleased with the splendid robe and overjoyed at learning to ride, for a horse is a rare sight in Persia, a mountainous country and one little suited to the breed. Now Cyrus and his mother sat at meat with the king, and Astyages, wishing the lad to enjoy the feast and not regret his home, plied him with dainties of every sort. At that, so says the story, Cyrus burst out, O oh, grandfather, what trouble you must give yourself, reaching for all these dishes and tasting all these wonderful foods. Ah, but, said Astyages, is not this a far better meal than you ever had in Persia? Thereupon, as the tale runs, Cyrus answered, our way, grandfather, is much shorter than yours, and much simpler. We are hungry and wish to be fed, and bread and meat brings us where we want to be at once. But you needs, for all your haste, take so many turns and wind about so much, it is a wonder if you ever find your way to the goal that we have reached long ago. Well, my lad, said his grandfather, 
we are not at all averse to the length of the road taste the dishes for yourself and see how good they are one thing i do see the boy said and that is that you do not quite like them yourself and when astyages asked him how he felt so sure of that cyrus answered because when you touch an honest bit of bread you never wipe your hands but if you take one of these fine kickshaws you turn to your napkin at once as if you were angry to find your fingers soiled well and good my lad well and good said the king only feast away yourself and make good cheer and we shall send you back to persia a fine strong fellow and with the word he had dishes of meat and game set before his grandson the boy was taken aback by their profusion and exclaimed grandfather do you give me all this for myself to do what i like with it certainly i do said the king whereupon without more ado the boy cyrus took first one dish and then another and gave them to the attendants who stood about his grandfather and with each gift he made a little speech that is for you for so kindly teaching me to ride and that is for you in return for the javelin you gave me i've got it still and this is for you because you wait on my grandfather so prettily and this for you sir because you honor my mother and so on until he had got rid of all the meat he had been given but you do not give a single piece to sacchus my butler quoth the grandfather and i honor him more than all the rest now this sacchus as one may guess was a handsome fellow and he had the right to bring before the king all who desired audience to keep them back if he thought the time unseasonable but cyrus in answer to his grandfather's question retorted eagerly like a lad who did not know what fear meant why should you honor him so much grandfather then astyages laughed and said can you not see how prettily he mixes the cup and with what a grace he serves the wine and indeed these royal cup-bearers are neat-handed at their task mixing the bowl with infinite elegance and pouring the wine into the beakers without spilling a drop and when they hand the goblet they poise it deftly between thumb and finger for the banqueter to take now grandfather said the boy tell sacchus to give me the bowl and let me pour out the wine as prettily as he if i can and win your favor so the king bade the butler hand him the bowl and cyrus took it and mixed the wine just as he had seen sacchus do and then showing the utmost gravity and the greatest deftness and grace he brought the goblet to his grandfather and offered it with such an air that his mother and astyages too laughed outright and then cyrus burst out laughing also and flung his arms round his grandfather and kissed him crying sacchus your day is done i shall oust you from your office you may be sure i shall make just as pretty a cup-bearer as you and not drink the wine myself for it is the fact that the king's butler when he offers the wine is bound to dip a ladle in the cup first and pour a little in the hollow of his hand and sip it so that if he has mixed poison in the bowl it will do him no good himself accordingly astyages to carry on the jest asked the little lad why he had forgotten to taste the wine though he had imitated sacchus in everything else and the boy answered truly i was afraid there might be poison in the bowl for when you gave your birthday feast to your friends i could see quite plainly that sacchus had put in poison for you all and how did you discover that my boy asked the king because i saw how your wits reeled and how you staggered and you all began doing what you will not let us children do you talked at the top of your voices and none of you understood a single word the others said and then you began singing in a way to make us laugh and though you would not listen to the singer you swore that it was right nobly sung and then each of you boasted of his own strength and yet as soon as you got up to dance so far from keeping time to the measure you could barely keep your legs and you seemed quite to have forgotten grandfather that you were king and your subjects that you were their sovereign then at last i understood that you must be celebrating that free speech we hear of at any rate you were never silent for an instant well but boy said astyages does your father never lose his head when he drinks certainly not said the boy what happens then asked the king he quenches his thirst answered cyrus and that is all 
no harm follows. You see, he has no Sacchus to mix his wine for him. But Cyrus, put in his mother, why are you so unkind to Sacchus? Because I do so hate him, answered the boy. Time after time, when I have wanted to go to my grandfather, this old villain has stopped me. Do please, grandfather, let me manage him for three days. And how would you set about it? Astyages asked. Why, said the boy, I will plant myself in the doorway, just as he does, and then when he wants to go into breakfast, I will say, You cannot have breakfast yet, he is busy with some people. And when he comes for dinner, I will say, No dinner yet, he is in his bath. And as he grows ravenous, I will say, Wait a little, he is with the ladies of the court. Until I have plagued him and tormented him, as he torments me, keeping me away from you, grandfather, when I want to come. Thus the boy delighted his elders in the evening, and by day if he saw that his grandfather or his uncle wanted anything, no one could forestall him in getting it. Indeed, nothing seemed to give him greater pleasure than to please them. Now when Mandane began to think of going back to her husband, Astyages begged her to leave the boy behind. She answered that, though she wished to please her father in everything, it would be hard to leave the boy against his will. Then the old man turned to Cyrus. My boy, if you will stay with us, Sacchus shall never stop you from coming to me. You shall be free to come whenever you choose, and the oftener you come, the better it will please me. You shall have horses to ride, my own and as many others as you like, and when you leave us, you shall take them with you. And at dinner you shall go your own way, and follow your own path to your own goal of temperance just as you think right. And I will make you a present of all the game in my parks and paradises, and collect more for you. And as soon as you have learnt to ride, you shall hunt and shoot and hurl the javelin exactly like a man, and you shall have boys to play with and anything else you wish for. You have only to ask me, and it shall be yours. Then his mother questioned the boy, and asked him whether he would rather stay with his grandfather in Media, or go back home with her. And he said at once that he would rather stay. And when she went on to ask him the reason, he answered, so the story says, Because at home I am thought to be the best of the lads at shooting and hurling the javelin, and so I think I am. But here I know I am the worst at riding, and that, you may be sure, mother, annoys me exceedingly. Now if you leave me here and I learn to ride, when I am back in Persia you shall see, I promise you, that I will outdo all our gallant fellows on foot. And when I come to Media again, I will try and show my grandfather that, for all his splendid cavalry, he will not have a stouter horseman than his grandson to fight his battles for him. Then said his mother, But justice and righteousness, my son, how can you learn them here when your teachers are at home? Oh, said Cyrus, I know all about them already. How do you know that you do? asked Mandane. Because, answered the boy, before I left home, my master thought I had learnt enough to decide the cases, and he set me to try the suits. Yes, and I remember once, said he, I got a whipping for misjudgment. I will tell you about that case. There were two boys, a big boy and a little boy, and the big boy's coat was small, and the small boy's coat was huge. So the big boy stripped the little boy and gave him his own small coat, while he put on the big one himself. Now in giving judgment, I decided that it was better for both parties that each should have the coat that fitted him best. But I never got any further in my sentence, because the master thrashed me here, and said that the verdict would have been excellent if I had been appointed to say what fitted and what did not, but I had been called in to decide to whom the coat belonged, and the point to consider was, who had a right to it? Was he who took a thing by violence to keep it, or he who had had it made and bought it for his own? And the master taught me that what is lawful is just, and what is in the teeth of the law is based on violence. And therefore, he said, the judge must always see that his verdict tallies with the law. So you see, mother, I have the whole of justice at my finger's ends already. And if there should be anything more I need to know, why... I have my grandfather beside me, and he will always give me lessons. But, rejoined his mother, 
What everyone takes to be just and righteous at your grandfather's court is not thought to be so in Persia. For instance, your own grandfather has made himself master over all and sundry among the Medes. But with the Persians, equality is held to be an essential part of justice. And first and foremost, your father himself must perform his appointed services to the state and receive his appointed dues. And the measure of these is not his own caprice, but the law. Have a care, then, or you may be scourged to death when you come home to Persia, if you learn in your grandfather's school to love not kingship but tyranny, and hold the tyrant's belief that he and he alone should have more than all the rest. Ah, but, mother, said the boy, my grandfather is better at teaching people to have less than their share, not more. Cannot you see, he cried, how he has taught all the Medes to have less than himself? So set your mind at rest, mother. My grandfather will never make me, or anyone else, an adept in the art of getting too much. End of section 3 Recording by John Ottens Cyrus by Xenophon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon Translated by H. G. Dakins Book 1, Chapter 4 So the boy's tongue ran on, but at last his mother went home, and Cyrus stayed behind and was brought up in Medea. He soon made friends with his companions and found his way to their hearts, and soon won their parents by charm of his address and the true affection he bore their sons, so much so that when they wanted a favor from the king, they bade their children ask Cyrus to arrange the matter for them. And whatever it might be, the kindliness of the lad's heart and the eagerness of his ambition made him set the greatest store on getting it done. On his side, Astyages could not bring himself to refuse his grandson's lightest wish. For once, when he was sick, nothing would induce the boy to leave his side. He could not keep back his tears, and his terror at the thought that his grandfather might die was plain for everyone to see. If the old man needed anything during the night, Cyrus was the first to notice it. It was he who sprang up first to wait upon him, and bring him what he thought would please him. Thus the old king's heart was his. During these early days, it must be allowed, the boy was something too much of a talker, in part, maybe, because of his bringing up. He had been trained by his master, whenever he sat in judgment, to give a reason for what he did, and to look for the like reason from others. And moreover, his curiosity and thirst for knowledge were such that he must needs inquire from everyone he met the explanation of this, that, and the other. And his own wits were so lively that he was ever ready with an answer himself for any question put to him, so that talkativeness had become, as it were, his second nature. But, just as in the body when a boy is overgrown, some touch of youthfulness is sure to show itself and tell the secret of his age. So for all the lad's loquacity, the impression left on the listener was not of arrogance, but of simplicity and warm-heartedness, and one would have gladly have heard his chatter to the end rather than have sat beside him and found him dumb. However, as he grew in stature and the years led him to the time when childhood passes into youth and he became more chary of his words and quieter in his tone, at times indeed, he was so shy that he would blush in the presence of his elders, and there was little sign left of the old forwardness. The impulsiveness of the puppy who will jump up on every one, master and stranger alike. Thus he grew more sedate, but his company was still most fascinating. And little wonder, for whenever it came to a trial of skill between himself and his comrades, he would never challenge his mates to those feats in which he himself excelled. He would start precisely one where he felt his own inferiority, averring that he would outdo them all. Indeed, he would spring to horse in order to shoot or hurl the javelin before he had got a firm seat, and then, when he was worsted, 
he would be the first to laugh at his own discomfiture. He had no desire to escape defeat by giving up the effort, but took glory in the resolution to do better another time, and thus he soon found himself as good a horseman as his peers, and presently such was his ardour. He surpassed them all, and at last the thinning of the game in the king's preserves began to show what he could do. What with the chasing and the shouting and the spearing, the stock of animals ran so low that Astyages was hard put to it to collect enough for him. Then Cyrus, seeing that his grandfather for all his good will could never furnish him with enough, came to him one day and said, Grandfather, why should you take so much trouble in finding game for me, if only you would let me go out to hunt with my uncle? I could fancy every beast we came across had been reared for my particular delight. But however anxious the lad might be to go out to the chase, he had somehow lost the old childish art of winning what he wanted by coaxing, and he hesitated a long time before approaching the king again. If in the old days he had quarrelled with Sakas for not letting him in, now he began to play the part of Sakas against himself, and could not summon courage to intrude until he thought that the right moment had come. Indeed, he implored the real Sakas to let him know when he might venture, so that the old butler's heart was won, and he, like the rest of the world, was completely in love with the young prince. At last, when Astyages saw that the lad's heart was really set on hunting in the open country, he gave him leave to go out with his uncle, taking care at the same time to send an escort of mounted veterans at his heel, whose business it was to keep watch and ward over him in any dangerous place or against any savage beast. Cyrus plied his retinue with questions about creatures they came across, which must he avoid and which might he hunt. They told him that he must be on his guard against bears and wild boars and lions and leopards. Many a man had found himself at too close quarters with these dangerous creatures, and had been torn to pieces. But antelopes, they said, and deer and mountain sheep and wild asses were harmless enough. And the huntsmen, they added, ought to be as careful about dangerous places as about the beasts themselves. Many a time horse and rider had gone headlong down a precipice to death. The lad seemed to take on all their lessons to heart at the time, but then he saw a stag leap up and forgot all the wise cautions he had heard, giving chase forthwith, noticing nothing except the beast ahead of him. His horse, in its furious plunge forward, slipped and came down on its knees, all but throwing the rider over its head. As luck would have it, the boy managed to keep his seat, and the horse recovered its footing. When they reached the flat bottom, Cyrus let fly his javelin, and the stag fell dead, a beautiful big creature. The lad was still radiant with delight, when up rode the guard and took him severely to task. Could he not see the danger he had run? They would certainly tell his grandfather that they would. Cyrus, who had dismounted, stood quite still and listened ruefully, hanging his head while they raided him. But in the middle of it all he heard the view halloo again. He sprang to his horse as though frenzied. A wild boar was charging down on them, and he charged to meet it, and drawing his bow with the surest aim possible, struck the beast in the forehead and laid him low. But now his uncle thought it was high time to scold his nephew himself. The lad's boldness was too much. Only, the more he scolded, the more Cyrus begged he would let him take back the spoil as a present for his grandfather, to which appeal, says the story, his uncle made reply. But if your grandfather finds out that you have gone in chase yourself, he will not only scold you for going, but me for letting you go. Well, let him whip me if he likes, says the boy. When once I have given him my beasts, and you too, uncle, he went on, punish me, however you choose, only do not refuse me this. So Cyaxares was forced to yield. Have it your way then. You are little less than our king already. Thus it was that Cyrus was allowed to bring his trophies home, and in due course presented them to his grandfather. 
See, grandfather, here are some animals I have shot for you. But he did not show his weapons in triumph. He only laid them down with the gore still on them where he hoped his grandfather would see them. It is easy to guess the answer as the ages gave. I must needs accept with pleasure every gift you bring me. Only I want none of them at the risk of your own life. And Cyrus said, If you really do not want them yourself, grandfather, will you give them to me, and I will divide them among the lads? With all my heart, said the old man, take them, or anything else you like. Bestow them where you will, and welcome. So Cyrus carried off the spoil, and divided it with his comrades, saying all the while, What foolery it was when we used to hunt in the park! It was no better than hunting creatures tied by a string. First of all, it was such a little bit of a place. And then, what scarecrows the poor beasts were, one halt and another maimed. But those real animals on the mountains and on the plains, what splendid beasts, so gigantic, so sleek and glossy. Why, the stags leapt up against the sky as though they had wings and the wild boars came rushing to close quarters like warriors in battle. And thanks to their breadth and bulk, one could not help hitting them. Why, even as they lie dead there, cried he, they look finer than those poor walled-up creatures when alive. But you, he added, could not your fathers let you go out to hunt too? Gladly enough, answered they, if only the king gave us the order. Well, said Cyrus, who will speak to Astyages for us? Why, answered they, who is so fit to persuade him as yourself? No, by all that's holy, not I, cried Cyrus. I cannot think what has come over me. I cannot speak to my grandfather any more. I cannot look him straight in the face. If this fit grows on me, I am afraid that I shall become no better than an idiot. And yet, when I was a little boy, they tell me, I was sharp enough at talking to which the other lads retorted, Well, it is a bad business altogether, and if you cannot bestir yourself for your friends, if you can do nothing for us in our need, we must turn elsewhere. When Cyrus heard that, he was stung to the quick. He went away in silence and urged himself to put on a bold face, and so went in to his grandfather, not, however, without planning first how he could best bring in the matter. Accordingly, he began thus. Tell me, grandfather, said he, if one of your slaves were to run away and you caught him, what would you do to him? What else should I do, the old man answered, but clap irons on him and set him to work in chains? But if he came back of his own accord, how would you treat him then? Why, I would give him a whipping, as a warning not to do it again, and then treat him as though nothing had happened. It's high time, then, said the boy, that you began getting a birch ready for your grandson. For I am planning to take my comrades and run away on a hunting expedition. Very kind of you to tell me beforehand, said Astyages. And now listen. I forbid you to set foot outside the palace grounds. A pretty thing, he added, if for the sake of a day's hunting I should let my daughter's lamb get lost. So Cyrus did as he was ordered, and stayed at home, but he spent his days in silence, and his brow was clouded. At last Astyages saw how bitterly the lad had felt it, and he made up his mind to please him by leading out a hunting party himself. He held a great muster of horse and foot, and the other lads were not forgotten. He had the beasts driven down into the flat country where the horses could be taken easily, and then the hunt began in splendid style, after the royal fashion, for he was present in person himself. He gave orders that no one was to shoot until Cyrus had hunted to his heart's content, but Cyrus would not hear of any such hindrance to the others. Grandfather, he cried, if you wish me to enjoy myself, let my friends hunt with me, and each of us try our best. Thereupon Astyages let them all go, while he stood still and watched the sight, and saw how they raced to attack the quarry, and how their ambition burned within them as they followed up the chase and let fly their javelins. 
but above all he was overjoyed to see how his grandson could not keep silence for sheer delight calling upon his fellows by name whenever he caught up with the quarry like a noble young hound baying them from pure excitement it gladdened the old man's heart to hear how gleefully the boy would laugh at one of his comrades and how eagerly he would applaud another without the slightest touch of jealousy at length it was time to turn and home they went laden with their mighty trophies and ever afterwards so well pleased was the king with the day's hunting that whenever it was possible out he must go with his grandson all his train behind him and he never failed to take the boys also to please cyrus thus did cyrus spend his early life sharing in and helping towards the happiness of all and bringing no sorrow to any man but when he was about fifteen years of age it chanced that the young prince of assyria who was about to marry a wife planned a hunting party of his own in honour of the bridal and having heard that on the frontiers of assyria and media there was much game to be got untouched and unmolested because of the war the prince chose these marches for his hunting ground but for safety's sake he took with him a large escort of cavalry and targeteers who were to drive the beasts down from their lairs into the cultivated levels below where it was easy to ride he set out to the place where the assyrian outposts were planted and the garrison on duty and there he and his men prepared to take their supper intending to begin the hunt on the morrow's dawn and as the evening had fallen it happened that the night watch a considerable body of horse and foot arrived from the city to relieve the garrison on guard thus the prince found that he had something like a large army at his call the two garrisons as well as the troop of horse and foot for the hunt and then he asked for himself whether it would not be the best of plans to drive off booty from the country of the medes in this way more lustre would be given to the chase and there would be great store of beasts for sacrifice with this intent he rose betimes and led his army out the foot soldiers he massed together on the frontier while he himself at the head of his cavalry rode up to the border fortresses of the medes here he halted with the strongest and largest part of his company to prevent the garrisons from sallying out and meanwhile he sent picked men forwards by detachments with orders to raid the country in every direction waylay everything they chanced upon and drive the spoil back to him while this was going on news was brought to astyages that the enemy was across the border and he hastened to the rescue at once himself at the head of his own bodyguard and his son with such troopers as were ready to hand leaving word for others to follow with all dispatch but when they were in sight of the assyrians and saw their serried ranks horse and foot drawn up in order compact and motionless they came to a halt themselves now cyrus seeing that all the rest of the world was off to the rescue boot and saddle must needs ride out too and so put on his armour for the first time and could scarcely believe that it was true he had longed so often and ardently to wear it all and right beautiful it was and right well it fitted the lad the armour that his grandsire had made for him so he put the whole accoutrement mounted his charger and galloped to the front and as the ages though he wondered who had sent the boy bade him stay beside him now that he had come cyrus as he looked at the horsemen facing them turned to his grandfather with the question can those men yonder be our enemies grandfather those who are standing so quietly beside their horses enemies they are too for all that said the king and are those enemies too the boy asked those who are riding over there yes to be sure well grandfather a sorry set they look and sorry jades they ride to ravage our lands it would be well for some of us to charge them not yet my boy answered his grandfather look at the mass of horsemen there if we were to charge the others now these friends of theirs would charge us for our full strength is not yet on the field yes but 
suggested the boy. If you stay here yourself, ready to receive our supporters, those fellows will be afraid to stir either, and the cattle lifters will drop their booty quick enough, as soon as they find they are attacked. Astyages felt there was much in what the boy said, and thinking all the while what wonderful sense he showed and how wide awake he was, gave orders for his son to take a squadron of horse and charge the raiders. If the main body move to attack, he added, I will charge myself and give them enough to do here. Accordingly, Cyaxares took a detachment of horse and galloped to the field. Cyrus, seeing the charge, darted forward himself and swept to the van, leading it with Cyaxares close at his heels and the rest close behind them. As soon as the plunderers saw them, they left their booty and took to flight. The troopers, with Cyrus at their head, dashed in to cut them off, and some they overtook at once and hewed down then and there. Others slipped past, and then they followed in hot pursuit, and caught some of them too. And Cyrus was ever in the front, like a young hound, untrained as yet, but from a gallant stock, charging a wild boar recklessly. Forward he swept, without eyes or thought for anything but the quarry to be captured and the blow to be struck. But when the Assyrian army saw their friends in trouble, they pushed forward, rank on rank, saying to themselves the pursuit would stop when their own movement was seen. But Cyrus never slackened his pace a whit. In a transport of joy, he called on his uncle by name as he pressed forward, hanging hot foot on the fugitives, while Cyaxares still clung to his heels, thinking maybe what his father Astyages would say if he hung back, and the others still followed close behind them, even if the faint-hearted changed into heroes for the nonce. Now, Astyages, watching their furious onslaught, and seeing the enemy move steadily forward in close array to meet them, decided to advance without a moment's delay himself, for fear that his son and Cyrus might come to harm, crashing in disorder against the solid battalions of the foe. The Assyrians saw the movement of the king and came to a halt, spears leveled and bows bent, expecting that when their assailants came within range, they would halt likewise as they had usually done before. For hitherto, whenever the armies met, they would only charge up to a certain distance, and there take flying shots, and so keep up the skirmish until evening fell. But now the Assyrians saw their own men borne down on them in rout, with Cyrus and his comrades at their heels in full career, while Astyages and his cavalry were already within bowshot. It was more than they could face, and they turned and fled. After them swept the Medes in full pursuit, and those they caught they mowed down, horse and man, and those that fell they slew. There was no pause until they came up with the Assyrian foot. Here, at last, they drew rein in fear of some hidden ambuscade, and Astyages led his army off. The exploit of his cavalry pleased him beyond measure, but he did not know what he could say to Cyrus. It was he to whom the engagement was due and the victory. But the boy's daring was on the verge of madness. Even during the return home, his behavior was strange. He could not forbear riding round alone to look into the faces of the slain, and those whose duty it was could hardly drag him away to lead him to Astyages. Indeed, the youth was glad enough to keep them as a screen between himself and the king for he saw that the countenance of his grandfather grew stern at the sight of him. So matters passed in Medea, and more and more the name of Cyrus was on the lip of every man, in song and story everywhere, and Astyages, who had always loved him, was astonished beyond all measure at the lad. Meanwhile his father, Cambyses, rejoiced to hear such tidings of his son, but when he heard that he was already acting like a man of years, he thought it full time to call him home again, that he might complete his training in the discipline of his fatherland. The story tells how Cyrus answered the summons, saying that he would rather return home at once so that his father might not be vexed or his country blame him. And Astyages, too, thought it was his plain duty to send the boy back. But he must needs give him horses to take with him, as many as he would care to choose, and other gifts beside not only for the love he bore him. 
but for the high hopes he had that the boy would one day prove a man of mark a blessing to his friends and a terror to his foes and when the time came for cyrus to go the whole world poured out to speed him on his journey little children and lads of his own age and grown men and greybeards on their steeds and astyages the king and so says the chronicle the eyes of none were dry when they turned home again cyrus himself they tell us rode away in tears he heaped gifts on all his comrades sharing with them what astyages had given to himself and at last he took off the splendid median cloak he wore and gave it to one of them to tell him plainer than words could say how his heart clung to him above the rest and his friends they say took the gifts he gave them but they brought them all back to astyages who sent them to Cyrus again. But once more Cyrus sent them back to Medea with his prayer to his grandfather. If you would have me hold my head up when I come back to you again, let my friends keep the gifts I gave them. And Astyages did what the boy asked. And here, if a tale of boyish love is not out of place, we might tell how, when Cyrus was just about to depart and the last goodbyes were being said, each of his kinsmen in the persian fashion and to this day the custom holds in persia kissed him on the lips as they bade him godspeed now there was a certain mede as beautiful and brave a man as ever lived who had been enamoured of cyrus for many long day and when he saw the kiss he stayed behind and after the others had withdrawn he went up to cyrus and said me and me alone of all of your kindred cyrus you refuse to recognize? And Cyrus answered, What are you my kinsman too? Yes, assuredly, the other answered. And the lad rejoined, Ah, then, that is why you looked on me so earnestly, and I have seen you look at me like that, I think, more than once before. Yes, answered the Mede, I have often longed to approach you, but as often, heaven knows, my heart failed me. But why should that be? said Cyrus seeing as you are my kinsman and with the word he leant forward and kissed him on the lips then the mede emboldened by the kiss took heart and said so in persia it is really the custom for relatives to kiss truly yes answered cyrus when we see each other after a long absence or when we part for a journey then the time has come said the other to give me a second kiss for i must leave you now with that cyrus kissed him again and so they parted but the travellers were not far on their way when suddenly the mede came galloping after them his charger covered with foam cyrus caught sight of him you have forgotten something is there something else you wanted to say no said the mede it is only such a long long while since we met such a little little while you mean my kinsman answered cyrus a little while repeated the other how can you say that cannot you understand that the time it takes to wink is a whole eternity if it severs me from the beauty of your face then cyrus burst out laughing in spite of his own tears and bade the unfortunate man take heart of grace and be gone i shall soon be back with you again and then you can stare at me to your heart's content and never wink at all End of section 4 The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon Translated by H. G. Dakins Book 1, Chapter 5 Thus Cyrus left his grandfather's court and came home to Persia, and there, so it is said, he spent one year more as a boy among boys. At first the lads were disposed to laugh at him, thinking that he must have learnt luxurious ways in Medea, but when they saw that he could take the simple Persian food as happily as themselves, and how, whenever they made good cheer at a festival, far from asking any more himself, he was ready to give his own share of the dainties away. 
when they saw and felt this and in other things his inborn nobleness and superiority to themselves then the tide turned and once more they were at his feet and when this part of his training was over and when the time was come for him to join the younger men it was the same tale once more once more he outdid all his fellows alike in the fulfilment of his duty in the endurance of hardship and in the reverence he showed to age and in the obedience he paid to authority now in the fullness of time astyages died in media and cyaxares his son the brother of cyrus's mother took the kingdom in his stead by this time the king of assyria had subdued all the tribes of syria subjugated the king of arabia brought the hyrcanians under his rule and was holding the bactrians in siege therefore he came to think that if he could but weaken the power of the medes it would be easy for him to extend his empire over all the nations around him, since the Medes were, without a doubt, the strongest of them all. Accordingly, he sent his messengers to every part of his dominions, to Croetius, king of Lydia, to the king of Cappadocia, to both the Phrygias, the Paphlagonians, and the Indians, to the Carians and the Sicilians, and he bade them spread slanders abroad against the Persians and the Medes, and say, moreover, that these were great and mighty kingdoms which had come together and made alliance by marriage with one another, and unless a man should be beforehand with them and bring down their power, it could not be but they would fall on each of their neighbors and turn and subdue them one by one. So the nations listened to the messengers and made alliance with the king of Assyria, some were persuaded by what he said, and others were won over by gifts and gold. For the riches of the Assyrian were great. Now Cyaxares, the son of Astyages, was aware of these plots and preparations, and he made ready on his side, so as far as in him lay, sending word to the Persian state, and to Cambryses the king, who had his sister to wife. And he sent to Cyrus also, begging him to come with all speed to the head of any force that might be furnished, if so be the council of Persia would give him men at arms. For by this time Cyrus had accomplished his ten years among the youths and was now enrolled with grown men. He was right willing to go, and the council of elders appointed him to command the force for Medea. They bade him to choose two hundred men among the peers each of them to choose four others from their fellows. Thus was formed a body of a thousand peers, and each of the thousand had orders to raise thirty men from the commons, ten targeteers, ten slingers, and ten archers. And thus three regiments were levied, ten thousand archers, ten thousand slingers, and ten thousand targeteers, over and above the thousand peers. The whole force was to be put under the command of Cyrus. As soon as he was appointed, his first act had been to offer sacrifice, and when the omens were favorable, he had chosen his two hundred peers, and each of them had chosen their four comrades. Then he called the whole body together, and for the first time spoke to them as follows. My friends, I have chosen you for this work. But this is not the first time that I have formed my opinion of your worth. From my boyhood I have watched your zeal for all that our country holds to be honorable, and your abhorrence for all that she counts base. And I wish to tell you plainly why I accepted this office myself, and why I ask your help. I have long felt sure that our forefathers were in their time as good men as we for their lives were one long effort towards the self-same deeds of valor as are held in honor now. And still, for all their worth, I fail to see what good they have gained, either for the state or for themselves. Yet I cannot bring myself to believe that there is a single virtue practiced among mankind merely in order that the brave and good shall fare no better than the base ones of the earth. Men do not forego the pleasures of the moment to say good-bye to all joy forevermore. 
No, this self-control is a training, so that we may reap the fruits of a larger joy in the time to come. A man will toil day and night to make himself an orator, yet oratory is not the aim of his existence. His hope is to influence men by his eloquence, and thus achieve some noble end. So too with us, and those like us, who are drilled in the arts of war. We do not give our labors in order to fight forever, endlessly and hopelessly. We hope that we too one day, when we have proved our mettle, may win and wear for ourselves and for our city the threefold ornament of wealth, of happiness, of honor. And if there should be some who have worked hard all their lives and suddenly old age, they find, has stolen them unawares and taken their powers before they have gathered the fruit of all their toil, such men seem to me like those who desire to be thrifty husbandmen, and who sow well and plant wisely. But when the time of harvest comes, let the fruit drop back ungarnered into the soil whence it sprang. Or if an athlete should train himself to reach the heights where victory may be won, and at the last forbear to enter the lists. Such a one, I take it, would but meet his deserts if all men cried out upon him for fool. Let not such be our fate, my friends. Our own hearts bear us witness that we, too, from our boyhood up, have been trained in the school of beauty and nobleness and honor, and now let us go forward to meet our foes. They, I know right well, when matched with us, will prove but novices in war. He is no true warrior, though he be skilled with the javelin and the bow, and ride on horseback with the best, who, when the call for endurance comes, is found to fail, toil finds him but a novice. Nor are they warriors who, when they should wake and watch, give way to slumber, sleep finds them novices. Even endurance will not avail. If a man has not learnt to deal as a man should by friends and foes, such a one is unschooled in the highest part of his calling. But with you it is not so. To you the night will be as the day. Toil, your school has taught you, is the guide to happiness. Hunger has been your daily condiment and water you take to quench your thirst as the lion laps the stream. And you have that within your hearts which is the rarest of all treasures and the most akin to war. Of all sweet sounds, the sweetest sound for you is the voice of fame. You are fair honor suitors, and you must needs win your title to her favor. Therefore you undergo toil and danger gladly. Now, if I said all this of you, and my heart were not in my words, I should but cheat myself. For in so far as you should fail to fulfill my hopes of you, it is on me that the shame would fall. But I have faith in you, bread of experience. I trust in your good will towards me, and in our enemy's lack of wit. You will not belie my hopes. Let us go forth with a light heart. We have no ill fame to fear. None can say we covet another man's goods unlawfully. Our enemy strikes the first blow in an unrighteous cause, and our friends call us to protect them. What is more lawful than self-defense? What is nobler than to succor those we love? And you have another ground of confidence. In opening this campaign, I have not been forgetful of the gods. You have gone in and out with me, and you know how in all things, great and small, I strive to win their blessing. And now, he added, what need of further words? I will leave you now to choose your own men, and when all is ready, you will march into Medea at their head. Meanwhile, I will return to my father and start before you, so that I may learn what I can about the enemy as soon as may be, and thus make all needful preparations, so that by God's help we may win glory on the field. End of section 5
Thyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer. Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 1, Chapter 6 Such were his orders, and they set about them at once. But Cyrus himself went home and prayed to the gods of his father's house, to Histia and Zeus, and to all who had watched over his race. And when he had done so, he set out for the war, and his father went with him on the road. They were no sooner clear of the city, so says the story, then they met with favorable omens of thunder and lightning. And after that they went forward without further divination, for they felt that no man could mistake the signs from the ruler of the gods. And as they went on their way, Cyrus's father said to him, My son, the gods are gracious to us, and look with favor on your journey. They have shown it in the sacrifices and by the signs from heaven. You do not need another man to tell you so, for I was careful to have you taught this art, so that you might understand the counsels of gods yourself, and have no need of an interpreter, seeing with your own eyes and hearing with your own ears, and taking in the heavenly meaning for yourself. Thus, you need not be at the mercy of any soothsayers who might have a mind to deceive you, speaking contrary to the omens vouchsafed from heaven nor yet should you chance to be without a seer drift in perplexity and know not how to profit by the heavenly signs you yourself through your own learning can understand the warnings of the gods and follow them yes father answered cyrus so far as in me lies i bear your words in mind and pray to the gods continually that they may show us favor and vouchsafe to counsel us i remember he went on how once I heard you say that, as with men, so with the gods. It was but natural if the prayer of him should prevail who did not turn to flatter them only in time of need, but was mindful of them above all in the heyday of his happiness. It was thus indeed, you said, that we ought to deal with our earthly friends. True, my son, said his father. And because of all my teaching, you can now approach the gods in prayer with a lighter heart and a more confident hope that they will grant you what you ask, because your conscience bears witness that you have never forgotten them. Even so, said Cyrus, and in truth I feel towards them as though they were my friends. And do you remember, asked his father, certain other conclusions on which we were agreed? how we felt when we were certain things that the gods had permitted us to attain through learning and study and training? The accomplishment of these is the reward of effort, not of idleness. In these it is only when we have done all that is our duty to do that we are justified in asking for blessings from the gods. I remember very well, said Cyrus, that you used to talk to me in that way and indeed I could not but agree with the arguments you gave. You used to say that a man had no right to pray he might win a cavalry charge if he had never learned how to ride, or triumph over master bowmen if he could not draw a bow, or bring a ship safe home to harbor if he did not know how to steer, or be rewarded with a plenteous harvest if he had not so much as sown grain into the ground or come home safe from battle if he took no precautions whatsoever. All such prayers as these, you said, were contrary to the very ordinances of heaven, and those who asked for things forbidden could not be surprised if they failed to win them from the gods, even as a petition in the face of law on earth would have no success with men. And do you remember, said his father, how we thought that it would be a noble work enough if a man could train himself really and truly to be beautiful and brave and earn all he needed for his household and himself? That, we said, was a work of which a man might well be proud. 
But if he went further still, if he had the skill and the science to be the guide and governor of other men, supplying all their wants and making them all they ought to be, that, it seemed to us, would be indeed a marvel. Yes, my father, answered Cyrus, I remember it very well. I agreed with you that to rule well and nobly was the greatest of all works, and I am of the same mind still. He went on, whenever I think of government in itself. But when I look on the world at large, when I see of what poor stuff those men are made who contrive to uphold their rule, and what sort of antagonists we are likely to find in them, then I can only feel how disgraceful it would be to cringe before them and not to face them myself and try conclusions with them on the field. All of them, I perceive, he added, beginning with our own friends here, hold to it that the ruler should only differ from his subjects by the splendor of his banquets, the wealth of gold in his coffers, the length and depth of his slumbers, and the freedom from trouble and pain. But my views are different. I hold that the ruler should be marked out from the other men not by taking life easily, but by his forethought and his wisdom and his eagerness for work. True, my son, the father answered, but you know the struggle must in part be waged not against flesh and blood, but against circumstances, and these may not be overcome so easily. You know, I take it, that if supplies were not forthcoming, farewell to this government of yours. Yes, Cyrus answered. And that is why Cyaxares is undertaking to provide for all of us who join him, whatever our numbers are. So, said the father, and you really mean, my son, that you are relying on these supplies of Cyaxares for this campaign of yours? Yes, answered Cyrus. And do you know what they amount to? No, he said. I cannot say that I do. And yet, his father went on, you are prepared to rely on what you do not know. Do you forget that the needs of the morrow must be high, not to speak of the outlay for the day? Oh, no, said Cyrus. I am well aware of that. Well, said his father, suppose the cost is more than Cyaxares can bear, or suppose he actually meant to deceive you. How would your soldiers fare? Ill enough, no doubt, answered he. And now tell me, father, while we are still in friendly country, if you know of any resources that I could make my own. You want to know where you could find resources of your own, repeated his father. And who is to find that out, if not he who holds the keys to power? We have given you a force of infantry that you would not exchange, I feel sure, for one that was more than twice its size. And you will have the cavalry of Medea to support you, the finest in the world. I conceive there are none of the nations round about who will not be ready to serve you, whether to win your favor or because they fear disaster. These are matters you must look into carefully in concert with Cyaxares, so that nothing should ever fail you of what you need, and, if only for habit's sake, you should devise some means of supplying your revenue. Bear this maxim in mind before all others. Never put off the collecting of supplies until the day of need. Make the season of your abundance provide against the time of dearth. You will gain better terms from those on whom you must depend if you are not thought to be in straits. And what is more, you will be free from blame in the eyes of your soldiers. That in itself will make you more respected. Wherever you desire to help or to hurt, your troops will follow you with greater readiness, so long as they have all they need, and your words, you may be sure, will carry the greater weight, the fuller your display of power, for weal or woe. Yes, father, Cyrus said, I feel all you say is true, 
and the more because as things now stand none of my soldiers will thank me for the pay that is promised to them they are well aware of the term Syaxares has offered for their help, but whatever they get over and above the covenanted amount, they will look upon as free gift, and for that they will, in all likelihood, feel most gratitude to the giver. True, said the father. And really for a man to have a force with which he could serve his friends and take vengeance on his foes, and yet neglect the supplies for it, would be as disgraceful, would it not, as a farmer who holds lands and laborers and yet allows fields to lie barren for lack of tillage? No such neglect, answered the son, shall ever be laid at my door. Through friendly lands or hostile, trust me, in this business of supplying my troops with all they need, I will always play my part. Well, my son, the father resumed. And do you remember certain other points which we agreed must never be overlooked? Could I forget them? answered Cyrus. I remember how I came to you for money to pay the teacher who professed to have taught me generalship. And you gave it to me, but you asked me many questions. Now, my boy, you said, did this teacher you want to pay ever mention economy among the things the general ought to understand? Soldiers, no less than servants in a house, are dependent on supplies. And I was forced to tell the truth and admit that not a syllable had been mentioned on that score. Then you asked me if anything had been taught about health and strength, since a true general is bound to think of these matters no less than of tactics and strategy. And when I was forced to say no, you asked me if he had taught me any of the arts which give the best aid in war. Once again, I had to say no, and then you asked me whether he had ever taught me how to kindle enthusiasm in my men. For in every undertaking, you said, there was all the difference in the world between energy and lack of spirit. I shook my head and your examination went on. Had this teacher laid no stress on the need for obedience in an army? Or on the best means of securing discipline? And finally, when it was plain that even this had been utterly ignored, you exclaimed, What in the world, then, does your professor claim to have taught you in the name of generalship? To that I could at least give a positive answer. He taught me tactics. And then you gave a little laugh and ran through your list point by point. And pray what will be the use of tactics to an army without supplies, without health, without discipline, without knowledge of those arts and inventions which are of use in war? And so you made it clear to me that tactics and maneuvers and drill were only a small part of all that is implied in generalship and when I asked you if you could teach me the rest of it, you bade me betake myself to those who stood high in repute as great generals, and talk with them and learn from their lips how each thing should be done. So I consorted with all I thought to be of authority in these matters. As regards to our present supplies, I was persuaded that what Syaxares intended to provide was sufficient, and... As for the health of the troops, I was aware that the cities where health was valued appointed medical officers, and the generals who cared for their soldiers took out a medical staff, and so when I found myself in this office, I gave my mind to the matter at once, and I flatter myself, father, he added, that I shall have with me an excellent staff of surgeons and physicians. To which the father made reply, Well, my son, but these excellent men are, after all, much the same as the tailors who patch torn garments. When folk are ill, your doctors can patch them up, but your own care for their health ought to go far deeper than that. Your prime object should be to save your men from falling ill at all. And pray, father, asked Cyrus, how can I succeed in that? Well, answered Cambyses. I presume if you are to stay long in one place, you will do your best to discover a healthy spot for your camp. 
and if you give your mind to the matter you can hardly fail to find it. Men, we know, are forever discussing what places are healthy and what are not, and their own complexions and the state of their own bodies is the clearest evidence. But you will not content yourself with choosing a site. You will remember the care you take yourself for your own health. Well, said Cyrus, my first rule is to avoid overfeeding as most oppressive to the system, and my next is to work off all that enters the body. That seems to be the best way to keep health and gain strength. My son, Cambyses answered, these are the principles you must apply to others. What? said Cyrus. Do you think that it would be possible for the soldiers to diet and train themselves? Not only possible, said the father, but essential. For surely an army, if it is to fulfill its function at all, must always be engaged in hurting the foe or helping itself. A single man is hard enough to support in idleness. A household is harder still. An army is hardest of all. There are more mouths to be filled, less wealth to start with, and greater waste, and therefore an army should never be unemployed. If I take your meaning, answered Cyrus, you think an idle general as useless as an idle farmer, and here and now I answer for the working general, and promise on his behalf that with God's help he will show you that his troops have all they need and their bodies are all they ought to be. And I think, he added, I know a way by which an officer might do much towards training his men in the various branches of war. Let him propose competitions of every kind and offer prizes. The standard of skill will rise, and he will soon have a body of troops ready to his hand for any service he requires. Nothing could be better, answered the father. Do this, and you may be sure you will watch your regiments at their maneuvers with as much delight as if they were a chorus in the dance. And then, continued Cyrus, to rouse enthusiasm in the men, there can be nothing, I take it, like the power of kindling hope. True, answered his father, but that alone would be as though a huntsman were forever rousing his pack with the view halloo. At first, of course, the hounds will answer eagerly enough, but after they have been cheated once or twice, they will end by refusing the call even when the quarry is really in sight. And so it is with hope. Let a man rouse false expectations often enough, and in the end, even when hope is at the door, he may cry the good news in vain. Rather ought he to refrain from speaking positively himself when he cannot know precisely. His agents may step in and do it in his place, but he should reserve his own appeal for the supreme crises of supreme danger and not dissipate his credit. By heaven, a most admirable suggestion, cried Cyrus, and one much more to my mind. As for enforcing obedience, I hope I have had some training in that already. You began my education yourself when I was a child teaching me to obey you, and when you handed me over to masters who did as you had done, and afterwards, when we were lads, my fellows and myself, there was nothing on which the governors laid more stress. Our laws themselves, I think, enforce this double lesson. Rule thou and be thou ruled. And when I come to study the secret of it all, I seem to see that the real incentive to obedience lies in the praise and honor that it wins against the discredit and the chastisement which fall on the disobedient. That, my son, said the father, is the road to the obedience of compulsion. But there is a shorter way to a nobler goal the obedience of the will. When the interests of mankind are at stake, they will obey with joy the man whom they believe to be wiser than themselves. You may prove this on all sides, and you may see how the sick man will beg the doctor to tell him what he ought to do. 
how a whole ship's company will listen to the pilot, how travellers will cling to the one who knows the way better as they believe than they do themselves. But if men think that obedience will lead them to disaster, then nothing, neither penalties nor persuasion nor gifts, will avail to rouse them. For no man accepts a bribe to his own destruction. You would have me understand, said Cyrus, that the best way to secure obedience is to be thought wiser than those we rule? Yes, said Cambyses. That is my belief. And what is the quickest way, asked Cyrus, to win that reputation? None quicker, my lad, than this. Wherever you wish to seem wise, be wise. Examine as many cases as you like and you will find that what I say is true. If you were wished to be thought as a good farmer, a good horseman, a good physician, a good flute player, or anything else whatever, without really being so, just imagine what a world of devices you would need to invent, merely to keep up the outward show. And suppose you did get a following to praise you and cry you up, suppose you did burden yourself with all kinds of paraphernalia for your profession, what would come of it all? You would succeed at first in a very pretty piece of deception, and then by and by the test comes, and the impostor stands revealed. But, said Cyrus, how can a man really and truly attain to the wisdom that will serve him his turn? Well, my son, it is plain that where learning is the road to wisdom, learn you must, as you learnt your battalion drill but when it comes to matters which are not to be learnt by mortal men, nor foreseen by mortal minds, there you can only become wiser than others by communicating with the gods through the art of divination. But, always, wherever you know that a thing ought to be done, see that it is done, and done with care, for care, not carelessness, is the mark of a wise man. And now, said Cyrus, to win the affection of those we rule, and there is nothing, I take it, of greater importance, surely the path to follow lies open to all those who desire the love of their friends. We must, I mean, show that we do them good. Yes, my child, but to do good, really at all seasons, to those we wish to help is not always possible. Only one way is ever open, and that is the way of sympathy. To rejoice with the happy in the day of good things, to share their sorrow when ill befalls them, to lend a hand in all of their difficulties, to fear disaster for them, and guard against it by foresight. These, rather than actual benefits, are the true signs of comradeship. And so in war, if the campaign is in summer, the general must show himself greedy for his share of the sun and the heat, and in winter for the cold and the frost, and in all labors for toil and fatigue. This will help make him beloved of his followers. You mean, father, said Cyrus, that a commander should always be stouter hearted in everything than those whom he commands. Yes, my son, that is my meaning, said he. Only be well assured of this, the princely leader and the private soldier may be alike in body, but their sufferings are not the same. The pains of the leader are always lightened by the glory that is his, and by the very consciousness that all his acts are done in the public eye. But now, father, suppose that the time has come, and you are satisfied that your troops are well supplied, sound in wind and limb, well able to endure fatigue, skilled in the arts of war, covetous of honor, eager to show their mettle, anxious to follow, would you not think it well to try the chance of battle without delay? By all means, said the father, if you are likely to gain by the move. But if not, for my own part, the more I felt persuaded of my own superiority in the power of my troops, the more I should be inclined to stand on my guard just as we put our greatest treasures in the safest place we have. But how can a man make sure that he will gain? Ah, there you come, said the father, to a most weighty matter. This is no easy task. 
I can tell you. If your general is to succeed, he must prove himself an arch-plotter, a king of craft, full of deceits and stratagems, a cheat, a thief, and a robber, defrauding and overreaching his opponent at every turn. Heavens! said Cyrus, and burst out laughing. Is this the kind of man you want your son to be? I want him to be, said the father, as just and upright and law-abiding as any man who ever lived. But how comes it, said his son, that the lessons you taught us in boyhood and youth were exactly opposed to what you teach me now? Ah, said the father, those lessons were for friends and fellow citizens, and for them they still hold good. But for your enemies, do you not remember that you are also taught to do much harm? No, father, he answered. I should say certainly not. Then why were you taught to shoot, or to hurl the javelin, or to trap wild boars, or to snare stags with cords and caltrops? And why did you never meet the lion, or the bear, or the leopard in fair fight, on equal terms, but were always trying to steal some advantage over them? Can you deny that all that was craft and deceit and fraud and greed? Why, of course, answered the young man, in dealing with animals, but with human beings it was different. If I was ever suspected of a wish to cheat another, I was punished, I know, with many stripes. True, said the father, and for the matter of that we did not permit you to draw bow or hurl javelin against human beings. We taught you merely to aim at a mark. But why did we teach you that? Not so that you might injure your friends, either then or now, but that in war you might have the skill to make the bodies of living men your targets. So also we taught you the arts of deceit, and craft, and greed, and covetousness, not among men, it is true, but among beasts. We did not mean you ever to turn these accomplishments against your friends, but in war we wished you to be something better than raw recruits. But father, Cyrus answered, if to do men good and to do men harm, were both of them things we ought to learn, surely it would have been better to teach them in actual practice. Then the father said, My son, we were told that in the days of our forefathers there was such a teacher once. This man did actually teach his boys righteousness in the way you suggest, to lie and not to lie, to cheat and not to cheat, to calumniate and not calumniate to be grasping and not grasping. He drew the distinction between our duty to friends and our duty to enemies, and he went further still. He taught men that it was just and right to deceive even a friend for his own good, or to steal his property. And with this, he must needs teach his pupils to practice on one another when he taught them, just as the people of Hellas, we are told, teach lad in the wrestling school to fence and to faint, and train them by their practice with one another. Now some of his scholars showed such excellent aptitudes for deception and overreaching, and perhaps no lack of taste for common money-making, that they did not even spare their friends, but use their arts on them. And so an unwritten law was framed by which we still abide, bidding us to teach our children as we teach our servants simply and solely not to lie, and not to cheat, and not to covert, and if they did otherwise to punish them, hoping to make them humane and law-abiding citizens. But when they came to manhood, as you have come, then, it seemed the risk was over, and it would be time to teach them what is lawful against our enemies. For at your age we do not believe you will break out into savagery against your fellows with whom you have been knit together since childhood in ties of friendship and respect. In the same way we do not talk to the young about the mysteries of love, for if lightness were added to desire, their passion might sweep them beyond all bounds. Then in heaven's name, father, said Cyrus, 
remember that your son is but a backward scholar and late learner in this lore of selfishness and teach me all that you can that may help me to overreach the foe well said the father you must plot and you must plan whatever the size of his force and your own to catch his men in disorder when yours are all arrayed unarmed when yours are armed asleep when yours are awake or you must wait until he is visible to you and you invisible to him or till he is laboring over heavy ground and you are in your fortress and can give him welcome there but how asked cyrus can i catch him in all these blunders simply because both you and he are bound to be often in some such case both of you must take your meals sometime both of you must sleep your men must scatter in the morning to satisfy the needs of nature and for better or for worse whatever the roads are like you will be forced to make use of them all these necessities you must lay to heart and wherever you are weaker there you must be most on your guard and wherever your foe is most assailable there you must press the attack then cyrus asked and are these the only cases where one can apply the great principle of greed or are there others oh yes there are many more indeed in these simple cases any general will be sure to keep good watch knowing how necessary it is but your true cheat and prince of swindlers is he who can lure the enemy on and throw him off his guard suffer himself to be pursued and get the pursuers into disorder lead the foe into difficult ground and then attack him there indeed as an ardent student you must not confine yourself to the lessons you have learnt you must show yourself a creator and discoverer you must invent stratagems against the foe just as a real musician is not content with the mere elements of his art but sets himself to compose new themes and if in music it is the novel melody the flower-like freshness that wins popularity still more in military matters it is the newest contrivance that stands the highest for the simple reason that such will give you the best chance of outwitting your opponent and yet my son i must say that if you did no more than apply against human beings the devices you learned to use against the smallest game you would have made considerable progress in this art of overreaching do you not think so yourself why to snare birds you would have to get up early in the depths of winter and tramp off in the cold your nets were laid before the creatures were astir and your tracks completely covered and you actually had birds of your own trained to serve you and decoy their kith and kin while you yourself lay in some hiding place seeing yet unseen and you had learnt by long practice to jerk in the net before the birds could fly away or you might be out after hares and for a hare you had two breeds of dogs one to track her out by scent because she feeds in the dusk and takes her form by day and another to cut off her escape and run her down because she is so swift and even if she escaped these she did not escape you you had all her runs by heart and knew all her hiding places and there you would spread your nets so that they were scarcely to be seen and the very haste of her flight would fling her into the snare and to make sure of her you had men placed on the spot to keep a lookout and pounce on her at once and there were you at her heels shouting and scaring her out of her wits so that she was caught from sheer terror and there lay your men as you had taught them silent and motionless in their ambuscade i say therefore that if you chose to act like this against human beings you would soon have no enemies left to fight or i am much mistaken and even if as well as may be the necessity should arise for you to do battle on equal terms in open field even so my son there will still be power in those arts which you have studied so long which teach you to out-villain villainry 
and among them I include all that has served to train the bodies and fire the courage of your men, all that has made them adepts in every craft of war. One thing you must ever bear in mind, if you wish your men to follow you, remember what they expect you to plan for them. Hence you must never know a careless mood. If it be night, you must consider what your troops shall do when it is day. If day, how the night had best be spent. For the rest, you do not need me to tell you now how you should draw upon your troops or conduct your march by day or night, along broad roads or narrow lanes, over hills or level ground, or how you should encamp and post your pickets, or advance into battle or retreat before the foe, or march past a hostile city, or attack a fortress or retire from it or cross a river and pass through a defile, or guard against the charge of cavalry or an attack from lancers or archers, or what you should do if the enemy comes into sight when you are marching in column, and how you are to take up position against him, or how to deploy into action if you are in line and he takes you in flank or rear, and how you are to learn all you can about his movements while keeping your own as secret as may be. These are matters on which you need no further word of mine. All that I know about them you have heard a hundred times, and I am sure you have not neglected any other authority on whom you thought you could rely. You know all their theories, and you must apply them now, I take it, according to circumstances and your need. But, he added, there is one lesson I would fain impress on you, and that is the greatest of them all. Observe the sacrifices and pay heed to the omens. When they are against you, never risk your army or yourself, for you must remember that men undertake enterprises on the strength of probability alone, and without any real knowledge as to what will bring them happiness. You may learn this from all life and all history, how often have cities allowed themselves to be persuaded into war, and that by advisers who were thought the wisest of men, and then been utterly destroyed by those whom they attacked? How often have statesmen helped to raise a city or a leader to power, and then suffered the worst at the hands of those whom they exalted? And many who could have treated others as friends and equals, giving and receiving kindness, have chosen to use them as slaves, and then paid the penalty at their hands. And many, not content to enjoy their own share of good, have been swept on by the craving to master all, and thereby lost everything that they once possessed. And many have won the very wealth they prayed for, and then through it have found destruction. So little does human wisdom know how to choose the best, helpless as a man who could but draw lots to see what he should do. But the gods, my son, who live forever, they know all things, the things that have been, and the things that are, and the things that are to be, and all that shall come from these. And to us mortals who ask their counsel, and to whom they love, they will show signs to tell us what we should do and what we should leave undone. Nor must we think it strange if the gods will not vouchsafe their wisdom to all men equally. No compulsion is laid on them to care for men, unless it be their will. End of section 6